Yeah, I'm from Sheffield Home University. I'll tell you a little bit about my background. You know, how did I end up being a university lecturer doing lectures like this? Um, I, my first proper job was in a big multinational, and that wasn't for me. So I decided I would want to, wanted, for better or worse, to take a salary cut and go work for a small cooperative in London that did consultancy services on information communication technology to uh, voluntary groups, charities, uh, government quangos. Uh, and I worked there for over a decade. Um, and it really just satisfied my personal curiosity that could cooperative working work. And yeah, it had its issues and problems, but you know, I, was, I got the bug. Um, but I also became very acutely aware of many of the limitations of, of the sort of forms that it could take at that time. Um, and so I went back to university, to Leeds University, and as, as an undergraduate, interestingly, I'd already got a degree, but I, I decided to do business studies as an undergraduate, and then having done one stage, a, a bursary for a PhD came up in Sheffield Hallam. It was a national scholarship award, and I went for that and got it, and I haven't looked back since in terms of developing my interest. But it's led me um, into many interesting areas, some of which I'm going to share with you today. Um, I do have a particular interest, it's not an exclusive interest, but a particular interest in the dynamics of employee ownership, um, and employee ownership is, has got a number of forms as well, so I'm going to look at the different forms that that can take, um, and also try and tackle this vexing question of, are these really social enterprises? Um, part of that journey was uh, to be part of a group of cooperatives in London. So. At the end of the 1990s, um, <coughs> most of the established worker co-ops and most of the established cooperative development agencies, together with a training organisation and a sort of umbrella financing organisation, got together and established Social Enterprise London. And Social Enterprise London, although it's perhaps not appreciated today, um, was the agency that established the Social Enterprise Journal and the first degree course at the University of East London. So it had a pivotal role as an agency, not just in supporting organisations on the ground, but getting the whole ball moving in the academic community as well. So looking back on it, you know, we had no idea what we were doing at the time. I didn't have a big role. I was one of the signatories to setting up the documents and then I sort of let it go and uh, went back and sort of talked to them later, years later. Um, but it's very interesting to see what it's become. So, uh, just to give you an orientation, I am going to look at some historical issues. Um, and there's quite a lot of interest, I think, in what's happening now compared to what was happening in sort of 1834. Um, so, an orientation here is, you know, if you can't learn from history, you're living in the Dark Ages. It's not, not an original quote, but it's a sentiment that I hope we can carry forward. Um, and... A lot of the attention to social enterprise is on the enterprise bit because a lot of organisations that are trying to get involved in this are coming from a voluntary or charity background and how can I engage with trading and uh, the disciplines of the market without losing my social values. Yeah? But with my background in co-ops and employee and businesses, <coughs> they, they, they're fine with the commercial side. You know, this, it doesn't hold any fears for them. They've already established their place one way or another. The issue is how do you sustain the social side? Yeah? How do you keep orienting your organisation so that you are listening to your customers, that you are listening to your staff and involving them in governance and involving them in decisions? Um, and it's challenging. You know, when you're faced with commercial situations, there's a lot of pressures on to, you know, to cut down on that. Um, so I tend to approach the whole question of social enterprise from a different perspective. And it's led me into something uh, we presented at uh, Skoll uh, the, the last May, was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, to, actually, there are two big groups of theories. Yeah? Lots of people are engaged in theories of social enterprise that are to do with the social purpose of the organisation. So I'll look at the task. What is the task? Is the task social? Who is, being, who is benefiting from the task that that organisation is doing? And it's, sort of, it's business with a social purpose, even to the extent now that in European countries, they actually have a legal form of social enterprise that's called a social purpose company. 
So it's even working its way into the legal frameworks of different European countries. But the issue here is that all of the sort of social stuff inside the organisation is instrumental. Yeah? It's all you, you form your relationships, you network, you do whatever you do to fulfil your social purpose. Um, so I think, very often, the management philosophy that underpins that doesn't really change that much. Yeah. You still have an instrumental view of the human being's role in delivering the social purpose of the organisation. You might have a very different view to the inclusivity of your beneficiary group or your community group, but inside the organisation, labour is still looked at instrumentally. And I think that can be contrasted with what I call socialised enterprises. Enterprises that typically take other legal forms. I'll go into those later. I'm not going to dwell on them here. Yeah. Um, but here, the, the process is to try to bring an accountability to the entrepreneurial process, an accountability to business processes, and also to socialise them in the sense of, of using inclusive practices in the decisions that are taking place inside the organisation, how different people are affected by the, the operations of the business. Um, and here, relationships themselves are ends. Yeah? The task of the organisation is to rebuild the community. You really don't care what you do as a business in many ways, as long as it's not killing people or making bombs or whatever. Um, the the, the, the organisation I studied for my doctorate just happened to make um, uh, school uniforms. And the entrepreneur was absolutely adamant. He'd have made anything. Yeah? It just happened that he used to be a school teacher and he had lots of friends in schools and he could create a business out of making school uniforms. But his real underlying purpose was to rebuild a depressed part of Sheffield. Um, and that was just the easiest way for him to do it. So the relationship between the people in the company and the relationship of the company to the community was much more important to him than what he did. Um, and it, it has a resonance with Mondragon, which I'm going to talk about. Um, the, one of, one of the founding sort of uh, thinkers of that movement said, uh, of cooperativism, said people have said that it's an economic movement that uses education at its root. They always put education at the centre of their model. But he said, I think it's the other way round. I think cooperativism is an educational movement that uses economic action as its <coughs> means. So, you, you get people involved in different business activities as a way of learning how to rebuild and sustain their community. And that it, that's so he, he saw it as an educational movement rather than as a business movement. And here I think the management philosophy does change. Yeah? So there really is something quite challenging at many levels. At the levels of ownership, at the levels of how you, uh, you know, resolve disputes within the organisation, who you admit into the membership of the organisation, all of these sort of questions uh, are, are thrown into a new frame. Now, I, I've, I have a particular um, set of writers that influenced me, and, and the one I would like to share with you, and one I, I have, do draw on in uh, chapter two, particularly of this book, is a chap called David Elliman. And the reason I was alerted to David Elliman was um, when I was first doing my first research in this field, um, which is over a decade ago now, um, I was talking to somebody in America who had uh, built a database of all the cooperatives in the UK, and they'd also developed a set of model rules, which I've continued to evolve uh, since I, I talked to them. But I asked him who were the most influential writers on his thinking when he was developing his model rules, and, he's, and David Elliman was one of those that he mentioned. And there was a particular passage, this is taken from a book, where he talks about the use of the words public and private. And he says that private is used in two senses usually. Something that isn't run by the government. So anything that isn't run by the government is, is talked about as private. So we talk about charities as being private often as well. You know, they're, they're based on citizen action. But also private in the sense of being based on private property rights that you buy your right to be involved in an organisation is because you've bought a bit of that organisation. Yeah. And he says that we're similarly ambiguous around the word public. Yeah? That we 
sort of public means of the government. But he thinks there's another way that we use public, which is that we have a, a growing culture based on human rights, or what he calls public rights, or personal rights. And, and he thinks that anything that comes from the political process that grants us rights is also uh, public. But he tends to call that social rather than public. He differentiates those. So what he argued was, if you keep, if you take private in the sense of non-governmental and combine it with public in the sense of being based on personal rights, you have a working definition of social. Yeah? And you can differentiate that from private in the sense of being based on private property and public in the sense of being owned by the government. Yeah? So you then end up with a view that a democratic firm, yeah, a firm that is owned and run by the people in it, because you have a personal right to be involved in governance in that organisation, it is a de facto social enterprise or a social institution. It shares the characteristics of a private business, perhaps in some respects, but not in others. And it might do public work or public good or community benefit as well, but not, in, not because it's owned by government. Yeah. And we can look at that a little bit more clearly. I hope this will help with understanding that. So you still have public as government-owned, government-sponsored projects. You still have private as enterprises that are owned through private property rights, but you now have space to understand two different distinct forms of social enterprise, one of which is based on personal rights to govern, yeah? often called mutuals or cooperatives, yeah? but it's based on your right as a citizen of that organisation, having uh, a, a right to the assets of the organisation and a voice in the organisation, and then you have the other version of private, which you can reinterpret as social or charitable social enterprises. Uh, yeah, come in. Um, where there's no share capital and you reinvest everything in for public or community benefit. And we seem to be much more familiar with the ones in the bottom right hand corner than we are with the ones in the top right hand corner. Uh, but that wasn't the case 10, 15 years ago. Most of what was going on was going up here. Is I think it's shifting back there with the new public debates about delivery of public services and um, NHS foundation trusts and even universities. Yeah. Um, but it, it opens up a new space for a new discussion and it also explains the social basis of it. So mutuality as a concept. I'll just let you read these two um, paragraphs and let those sink in. <clears throat> 